Hi there, Flutter developers. Interested in adding the power of Firebase to your Flutter apps? Well, you've come to the right place. Let's find out how on this episode of Firecast. So I'm going to assume that you already have a Flutter app that is up and running that you want to work with. Now, for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to use the basic counter app that you get by default when you create a new Flutter project. But you can follow along with just about any Flutter app that you've already got built. The process should be the same. Now, there are four steps to getting the Firebase platform up and running. Number one, creating a project in the Firebase console and adding our Flutter apps to that project. Number two, downloading a few constants files and adding them to your Flutter project. Number three, installing the SDKs. And then number four, initializing the Firebase platform in your code. Now, by the way, if you are a seasoned Android developer, you might be used to using the Android Studio Firebase Assistant to get Firebase running in your app. Now, we're not going to be doing that here. It's going to be a little more manual, but not to worry. Just follow along with me, and we'll get this built together. So the first thing I'm going to do is head on over to the console at firebase.google.com console to create a new Firebase project. Now, when you first visit the Firebase console, you'll see a few options here for what to do next. Depending on your situation, you might see a list of existing Firebase projects, or you might just have an Add Project button. Now, I'm going to go ahead and click that because I want to create a new project. And before we go any further, let me take a moment to explain the difference between projects and apps. So a project can contain one or more platform-specific apps. Now, all apps in the same project use the same Cloud Firestore, real-time database, and auth backends, and you can view combined analytics data across all apps in the same project. You can also use features like Firebase Cloud Messaging or in-app messaging to talk to all of your apps at once. You don't have to, but you can, which is sometimes convenient. So in general, if you have different versions of the same app running on different platforms, such as Android and iOS, you'll want to add each of those apps to the same Firebase project. On the other hand, if your apps really are different, then you should put those in different Firebase projects. And for those of you building like multi-tenant apps, we generally recommend using a separate Firebase project for each of your customers in order to keep their data nicely separated. Now, if you're building a Flutter app, you're probably doing this so that you can have the same app running on both iOS and Android. So what we're going to do is create a single Firebase project, and then we'll attach both versions of our Flutter app to it. Um, and for now, I am just sticking to the iOS and Android versions of our app, since web support at the time of this recording is still a little experimental and subject to change. But maybe I'll add that in a future video. So I'm going to create a new project here. I can give it a name. Although you'll notice I also have this drop down box beneath the name. This gives me the option to add Firebase features onto any existing Google Cloud projects I have access to. Now, if you do this, this will keep all the capabilities of your existing Google Cloud project while adding in some of the new services needed for Firebase. So if you are working on a project that you've already set up through Google Cloud, make sure you pick that. Don't create a new Firebase project. In my case, though, I am starting a brand new project, so I'm just going to type in a new name. You can see here it's giving me a little ID string here, which will get updated as I type. This is the project ID, which is a globally unique identifier for your project across both Firebase and Google Cloud. It's not public facing, so don't worry too much if you see random characters at the end or anything. Now, I'm going to click on the Continue button. And uh, now I get to choose whether or not to add Google Analytics to my project. Enabling Analytics will allow me to use a number of useful features, such as A-B testing, better remote config targeting, and getting crash-free user reports. If I don't enable Analytics, I won't be able to use those features. It's totally optional, and you can add it later, so go with whatever works for you. Personally, I'm going to keep Analytics enabled. Now, if you do, you're going to need to associate this project with an Analytics account. Now, an account isn't an account like a Gmail account or anything. It's really just like a folder of analytics projects, and it's mostly there for organizational purposes. Some developers like to have separate accounts for each project. Me, I like to have this default one for all of my test projects, so that's where this is going. Now I can proceed to the next step, which is actually creating the project. Firebase will think for a few moments, and then I will have a shiny new project to work with. OK, the next step is adding both the Android and the iOS versions of my Flutter app to this project. So let's start with the Android version. I'm going to go ahead and click on the Android icon here. And I have a few fields to fill out. So first up is adding my Android package name, also known as your application ID. If you don't remember what this is, you can look it up in Android Studio by going to your Android app build.gradle file and scrolling down here to where it says application ID. And actually, while we're here, I have heard from some of our engineers that you're going to be much better off if you can set your min SDK version to 21 or later so that you don't run into a number of methods limit later on. 
So I'm going to do that. At the time of this recording, this will still be compatible with like 94.1% of all devices out there in the world. So I think that's a reasonable trade-off. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and grab my application ID here, and I can paste that back into the dialog box. Now, this app nickname, it's strictly internal and just a way of identifying my app in a user-friendly way in the Firebase console. So I'm going to go ahead and call it Amazing Counter Android. Finally, I'm being asked to optionally add the SHA-1 hash of my debug signing certificate so my app can kind of prove that it belongs to me. Yeah, that's an oversimplification. Go check out the docs for a real answer. Now note that this is optional. It's really only used in a few situations like Firebase Dynamic Links and Google Sign-In, so you can leave it out and provide it later in your Firebase project settings. In fact, I kind of recommend leaving this out until you need it. This is because you can't have the same combination of package name and SHA-1 hash in more than one place anywhere in Firebase. And so if you or somebody else on your project team ends up registering your app in like a test project with your shared production key, and then decide you want to register it in a different project later on, you're going to have to hunt down that original project and delete the signature, and that may be kind of a hassle, particularly if a lot of folks in your company have access to that SHA-1. I've heard stories from our support people, and this happens more often than you think. So you know what? I'm not even going to touch this right now. If you do want to add that in, follow the instructions in this link here. But for now, I'm going to move on to the next step, which is to download this JSON file. I'm going to download Google services.json by clicking this button. Do make sure it doesn't have like a one in parentheses after it if you're like me and download a lot of Google services files. And then next, I'm going to drag it into my Android project. Uh, you should make sure you place it in your Android slash app folder, uh, kind of like this. Now, if we look at this file, you can see that it basically contains a bunch of constants that the Firebase SDK needs to configure itself correctly. It's got the name of my project, the cloud storage bucket I might use, some OAuth client IDs, and so on. Now, none of this is really secret, but you should really only share this file with your team. If you're making like an open source demo app to be shared publicly, you'll probably want anybody who runs their project to generate their own version of this file to hook up to their own Firebase project. Now, in my case, I'm not sharing this app publicly. This is just for me and my team, so I could check it into my personal Git repository if I had one. OK, next, we're being told to make a few Gradle changes. In a sort of somewhat unusual move, uh, the first change we need to make is in our project level Gradle file. So let me open this one in Android, build.gradle. And first, I'm going to confirm that Google is listed in my build script repositories and in my all projects repositories, and it is. Then I'll copy this line into my dependencies section to make sure that we are using this plugin here. And by the way, all you experienced Android developers, don't confuse this with Google Play services. This Google services plugin is really just used to parse that JSON file we added. We really only need it to initialize our app. OK, next up, let's open up our app level Gradle file. That's this one under Android app build.gradle. And this is where I apply that Google services plugin in my app Gradle file, which I can do by copying and pasting this line here into my file alongside all these other apply plugin lines. But you can ignore these lines here about like importing the Firebase bill of materials or the analytics library. Yes, in a normal Android project, this would also be where we would install and activate our other Firebase libraries. And the bill of materials is sort of a nice way of doing that in a version safe way. But in a Flutter app, we're going to save that for our pubspec.yaml file at a later point. By the way, the documentation also tells us that this would be a good time to run Flutter pub get. Honestly, I don't think that's necessary here since we haven't changed anything in our pub spec file. But uh, you know, I guess it never hurts. So uh, go ahead and run it if you really want. But I think it's probably superfluous. OK, next we can go ahead and skip the rest of these dialogues in the Firebase console. And that's Android taken care of. All right, next up, let's get our iOS app set up too. So to get our iOS app added to this project, I'm going to click this Add App button and then select the iOS logo. Now, uh, be careful. You might think your iOS bundle ID is the same as your Android application ID, but it often isn't. iOS likes to use camel case, while Android prefers underscores. Uh, so let's be safe and open up our generated iOS project in Xcode and find out for sure. So from Android Studio, I'm going to select Tools, and then Flutter, and then Open iOS Module in Xcode. I'll wait a moment. And uh, now that I'm here, let me look at my runner project. And I'll select the runner target. And here we can find my bundle identifier. OK, so uh, let me copy and paste this bundle identifier into my dialog here. For app nickname, again, just pick anything vaguely user friendly. I'll probably stick with amazing counter iOS here. OK, next up, they're asking for your app store ID. 
Now, if you were to use dynamic links, this would be used to send users to the correct App Store page if a user clicks on a dynamic link and doesn't have your app installed. It's optional and you can totally add it in later if you don't have an App Store ID at the moment. In my case, I don't have an App Store ID for my amazing counter app, so I'm just gonna leave this blank. So I will click Register App. And now I can download the Google Service Info plist file. Now again, watch that the file that gets downloaded doesn't have a number in parentheses after it. This does tend to happen more often in the iOS world. And if it does, just do a little file renaming to make sure it's just called Google Service Info .plist. Okay, next we're gonna drag this file into Xcode. Yes, really Xcode, not Android Studio. I think you can put it anywhere in your project, but the docs recommend sticking it inside your runner folder like this. Now make sure copy items if needed is checked and they go ahead and click okay. And then you can ignore the rest of this setup wizard in the Firebase console. Like don't worry about adding new CocoaPods or anything. The Flutter build tools will take care of that for you later. Okay, we are done with the Firebase console for now and even better, done with all of our platform specific work. So you can close Xcode and all those Android Gradle files. Let's move on to the next step and that's installing the libraries. Now, honestly, this step is pretty straightforward if you've installed any Flutter packages before. Just remember that to keep your app nice and thin, you should really only install the libraries for features that you need. In fact, you'll probably notice that there is no all encompassing Firebase package that installs everything for you. You're gonna to need to install each individual feature separately, but that's fine, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna head on over to the firebase.flutter.dev site. And here you can find a full list of these packages, what platforms they support, links to source code, along with their entries on pub.dev, which is kind of nice. Now it's important to point out that this one here, Firebase Core, is the basic library that you're gonna need to install no matter what else you're using. This is the library that does all the initialization and setup work for you. So if you don't have this, nothing else will work. So we're gonna install that one first. Now, these are basically installed the way any other Flutter packages. You can jump on over to the page on pub.dev, head over to the installing section, and copy and paste this line into your pubspec.yaml file in Flutter down here in the dependencies section. And, you know, as always, make sure those spaces line up. You only want two here. So we're done installing Firebase Core, but since I guess I want to see our app actually do something, for the purpose of this video, I'm going to install, say, the real-time database. So I'll go back to that firebase.flutter.dev page and I'll do the same thing here. Obviously these version numbers may look different than when you're doing this, just go ahead with whatever version is listed on the site. And once you do all this, you'll wanna do a Flutter pub get. So uh, yes, Android Studio, thanks for the suggestion. Let's run that. Okay, so if we were to run this now, our app should still be in a good working state, but it won't look or behave any different than before since we haven't actually done anything with a Firebase library yet. So uh, let's do that next. Now, as a general rule, you'll want to initialize the Firebase library before you do anything else in your app. That makes sure Firebase is ready to do things like process session start events and analytics, process incoming dynamic links, or sign your user in. So in our main.dart file, before we even call run app, I'm going to call await firebase.initializeapp. And let's also import Firebase core so that we don't get an error. This await call basically tells Flutter to not go ahead and start our app until we're done initializing Firebase, which should happen very quickly. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised it's even an asynchronous method here, but I guess we need to do that since we're calling out to native processes. But because this is an await call, Flutter is going to complain that we're putting it inside a function that's not marked asynchronous. So I can just alt enter and select add async modifier and Android Studio fixes this up nicely for me. So uh, let's do a full restart here. I often like doing that if I'm messing with main. And you can see that I'm now getting this weird exception around how services binding default binary messenger was accessed before the binding was initialized. So I don't entirely know what's happening here, but I'm guessing somewhere in the Firebase initialization code, it's trying to access this default binary messenger object, which itself hasn't quite finished initializing yet. And so we're running into some kind of race condition. Luckily, the error message tells us exactly how to fix it, which is to explicitly call widgets flutter binding dot ensure initialized first. So uh, that's easy enough. We'll copy and paste it into here, restart my app again, and it works. And this is nice, but I'm not a big fan of this blocking await call right here. While Firebase generally initializes quickly, I don't like having your app do nothing while we're waiting for an asynchronous call. So I think the best thing to do here is to use a future builder. As you may know, a future is basically a placeholder for an asynchronous operation that will complete sometime in the, well, in the future. 
It's kind of like an async task in Android land or a promise in JavaScript. And you can check out Andrew's video in the link below for more info. And a future builder is, to oversimplify a little bit, a widget that builds another widget once a future has completed. It also conveniently lets you create an intermediary widget, like say a loading screen, while you're waiting for this future to resolve. So let's do that here. I'm going to remove this initialize call here. And down here in my app, I'll set up final Firebase app underscore FB app equal to Firebase initialize app, and I'll remove the await call. Android Studio will complain that FB app should be a future that resolves to Firebase app, so uh, we can fix that here. And then what I'll do down here in my build call is to keep this material app, but for my home widget, I'm going to use a future builder. So for the future property here, I will specify FB app. This is telling the future builder what future I want to be monitoring. And then for my builder, well, this is the callback that gets called initially, but then also gets called when there's a change in the state of my future, either when there's an error or it's been completed. So what I can do here is check and see. If there's an error, well, let's print out the error to the console, and I will return a very basic error screen. You'll probably want to do something a little nicer than this, but you get the idea. Otherwise, we'll check and see if our snapshot has data is true. If it is, well, that probably means that the future has been resolved properly and Firebase has been properly initialized. So I'm going to go ahead and return the original my home page widget. And then otherwise, I will return a very basic loading indicator. OK, there. Now I feel like we have a properly initialized app. So let's run this. And well, my app is running, but it still looks the same as before. How can we tell that we have Firebase actually working properly? Well, if we were to look in the log cat while running the Android version of our app and filter for the word Firebase, you should hopefully see this line here about how Firebase app initialization was successful. And so at this point, you are pretty much ready to go. But if you want to see something a little more exciting than a line of debug text in your console, I'm going to do some quick hacking in the next 60 seconds to get some basic real-time database functionality working. Remember, I already went ahead and added the real-time database in my pubspec.yaml file earlier. So let's see, here's what we're going to do. In my increment counter method, before we call set state, let's create a database reference by saying that database reference underscore test ref equals Firebase database dot instance dot reference to get a reference to our real time database. And then we'll call child to hit a child node that we will call, say, test. And then let's just set that to a value of hello world followed by a random number. I'm going to just confirm that dart.math and the real time database libraries were imported, and they were. So uh, I think that should do it. So we can hot reload, click the button, and uh, whoops, huh. Well, we're getting some kind of permission denied error. Um, oh, I know, I forgot to enable the database in the Firebase project. So I'm going to head on over to the console. I will jump to the real time database tab and say, yes, I really do want to create a database. We'll start it out in test mode, which means everybody can access our database, which is a terrible idea, but will work for now. And now when I click the button, hey, look at that. There's a value changing the database. That's very exciting. Now, again, this was super quick and dirty, and we will hopefully create a tutorial in the near future on how to properly use the real-time database in your application. But it's good to know we have Firebase working and connected to a real backend. All right. So now that you have Firebase properly set up and initialized in your code, there is lots more you can do. You can store, query, and sync data from the cloud using either the real-time database or Cloud Firestore. And I recommend checking out the database picker in our documentation if you're wondering which one is right for you. You can use Firebase Auth to easily sign in your users from a variety of sign-in providers. You can record events and user properties in analytics to find out what your users are really doing in your app, and combine that with remote config to run A-B tests or personalize your app for different groups of users. You can add services like Crashlytics so you can find out exactly where your app is crashing and why, and so much more. In fact, you know what? Let me know in the comments below which features you most want to see, and uh, I'll see if I can work on those first for future episodes of Firecasts. And of course, if you want to find out more, why not subscribe to our YouTube channel? You can also check out the documentation at firebase.flutter.dev and play around with any of our sample apps. So have fun creating, and I will see you soon on another episode of Firecasts. Mm -hmm.